Hello. Hey, good morning. Good morning. We're looking out in the neighborhood. We're Jehovah's Witnesses and talking oh. to your neighbors. Okay. We actually live down here a few blocks, a uh, few blocks down. Okay. My name is Sam. My dad, Alberto. Hello. Hello. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Nice beard, man. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, so all we're doing is we're talking about this. It's just that we have this in print in Spanish. It's, it's about uh, how to enjoy life forever. Um, a lot of people have a lot of views about that statement. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what your view is. I'm about, a Christian. I'm a Christian. What is your view about eternal life? Eternal life is through faith in Jesus, trusting in Him. That's His promise. He says in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who hears my voice and believes Him who sent me has eternal life. So faith awesome. in Christ is how we have eternal life in God. Mm, awesome. Yeah. You guys um, believe that? We do. We do believe about, about the eternal life that Jesus offers as a, as a heavenly offering and also as a help of earthly offering. So we, we have a, almost a two-part thing, right? So. Um, yeah, you believe there's 144,000 that will be with God in heaven forever, but then the rest spend eternity on earth. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, the reason for our thinking on that is the many scriptures that, that have mentioned about life on earth on a almost paradise condition right right enough food for everybody it's just when you see the planet how beautiful it is and all the things about you know raising a family everything that is related to that we know from the scriptures that god didn't mean to scratch that planet for it to go away yeah it's yeah. just postpone it for a little while, I know there's a lot of tribulation, a lot of things going on in the world that, that yeah. makes people feel like, hey, we want to get out of here. This is this is a horrible place really right now in a yeah. lot of places, right? Yeah. So that that's our view, you know. I'm not, I don't want to take your entire day. No, that's okay. This, yeah, but, and um, I would say one thing that's that's clear too, yeah, for sure, is that you know God creates man in a garden, and His presence is with them. Heaven, heaven and earth are together in the beginning. Sin breaks that, and then the story of redemption is God restoring all of that. But in the, in the garden, God was walking with them. He wasn't in a separate place called heaven. He, heaven and earth were together. Um, so that would be, I think, one of the distinctions between uh, biblical faith and Christian faith and uh, what the Watchtower has said is there's this place called heaven out there, mm -hmm. and earth is over here, and 144,000 will go there. And then the rest will be here, whereas Scripture says God, the restoration of all things is bringing us back to that garden where heaven and earth are together, and God's presence is with His people. Um, yes, and that is in Revelation. You're you're very correct about yeah, that. It yeah. says that the the tent of God will be with humanity, and and He will take care of them. And, and it almost kind of it almost seems like that union it will happen at that mm -hmm. point, right? Um, you mentioned I, it, but you mentioned tribulation and sort of. Do yes, you, do we do. We do believe about um, that. We we live in the last days. We live in the, in a time where uh, the great tribulation will break out, mm -hmm. um, given the signs that Jesus gave. Right. Where Where do you get that from? Where, where at? So when he mentioned in, in Matthew, he mentioned that, that there will be a great tribulation that no man has ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, that if you hear about wars and famine and things mm -hmm. like that, that's just the beginning of the signs. It's not really. This is it. That this is when it's going to start. No, it's just the beginning of the signs. So you mentioned uh, that from Matthew twenty-four. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So have you guys? I'm sure you have read it. Did you when you were reading it? And Jesus actually says that that's going to happen in that generation before they all died. He was speaking to them because the disciples came to him and said, "When should these things be? Mm -hmm. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age, not the end of the world?" Um, the word there isn't cosmos. It's it's the end of the age. And then he tells them what to look for, and he tells them that um, this generation, that he used that a lot and when mm -hmm. he spoke to them, that generation, he said, will not pass away until all these things come to pass. And all those things were also the wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence. So according to Jesus, if he's a true prophet, all those things had to happen to that generation. Now, I, I believe they did, and Christians historically, many have believed that they did happened in that generation the temple was taken apart yes not one stone was left upon yeah. another mm -hmm. well you said the temple being taken apart and the wars and rumors of wars and pestilence plague and all that was going to happen in that generation and it all did happen before the destruction of the temple mm -hmm. so that's i think that's curious to me is why would you believe that that's about our day when jesus so says it was about their day? there's other indicators there um and i could kind of 
get a little backup on that. Yeah. Um, that demonstrate that there will be a greater fulfillment of what he said. What right? would those indicators be? So I'll have to pull the information out of yeah. from the top of my head. I'm well, yeah, because if you're talking about the Great Tribulation, it's the Olivet Discourse, Mark 13, Luke 21, Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. They're they're mm -hmm. the same. Uh, and in all of those texts, Jesus puts a time indicator on it, saying it's going to happen before they all so die. So one one of those indicators is um, remember that Matthew 24, uh, 14, what it says regarding the good news of the kingdom. That are preached throughout all the world. Mm -hmm. Paul so said at that, that time, Paul they, said were, that they, were, they, were, they were already barely getting started. Even though Paul said, I have completed my circuit, it didn't mean that the entire world was... The language, the, that right? language of the day that it was the, the, the known world. The so, world. so he, Paul did, actually didn't say circuit. He said uh, that um, the gospel had been preached throughout all the world he, yeah, in that um, generation. And that's the Roman Empire. The gospel had gone throughout the entire known world, the Roman Empire. That's the language that was used. But think about it from from historical evidence. Do you think it got to the Gaelics and everybody else no, in that's other not, areas? No, right? so what but that's not the language he was using. Correct, they, correct. They so, so there was in, still a gap, right? No, no. He actually had said that the gospel had been preached to every creation, uh, every creature under heaven, in the first century. For him, right? That's so. That's the language. We have Asia. That was, there were there were people in Asia. There were so so. If you view it in, in the viewpoint of God. In order to have that fulfillment, it's, it's global. It's not localized to the language in that so area. So Jesus was a false prophet? No, I'm not saying that. Because he said that that we, was going to happen we, before. We could, we could misinterpret that saying, he well, just said here, but how about if he meant larger? Well, except that at the end of the discourse you're referring to, it ends with Jesus, Jesus saying, all these things will take place before this generation passes away, including the gospel going throughout the entire world, which the apostles, who were inspired by God, said happened. And... You, you, I would say your interpretation would make Jesus a false prophet. Well, let me correct that. Um, maybe I mentioned it in the wrong way. Okay. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that in 14... It's and in, I have... It's in Espanol. Uh, <laughs> it's in Espanol. <laughs> let me look for... Um, the English. Uh, let me let me look for the American Standard Version. Good literal translation. Yeah, that way I'm not throwing something in there like, hey, uh, is that the Jehovah Witness Bible? The New World? <laughs> no, 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 the American Standard's a, a good literal uh, word for word. Did you use that one? Did you use that one? That's a good one. ESV. I mean, there's a lot of really great English translations of the. Yeah, King James. Um, yeah. But other than that, uh, Rotherham. Um, I find it hard to understand in English. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, um, the the American New American Standard, American Standard. You're going to get mostly literal. So while that while that downloads, um, I'll do this one. The, the internet sometimes not that good. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when I got T-Mobile. You know what I'm saying? But um, and and this this will make it a little bit more. Maybe I could speak out to to the point I'm trying to make. Um, so when and this is this is how how you know how I'm viewing it um when the world for the testament of on all nations mm -hmm. and then shall the end come right so and Paul there was that. an end to the Jewish system but the presence of him him coming back the sign of the heavens does does well, that happen yeah, there yeah look right here so if you keep going, the discourse starts um, when they ask the question, the disciples mm -hmm. ask him the question, he's just indicted the Jewish leadership in Matthew 23, and he says that, um, he says that um, their, their house is left to them desolate. And now the disciples are freaking out over this, and so they ask him, what will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming, the end of the age? And he tells them, um, he says, all the things about the false uh, saying I'm the Christ that happened in the first century many false Christs after the time of Christ mm -hmm. happened led people out into the wilderness wars and rumors of wars uh, when he spoke this it was time of the Pax Romana the peace of Rome mm -hmm. and so when Jesus says there's gonna be wars and rumors of wars that have been shocking because Rome didn't allow that it's the Pax Romana and uh, that generation saw so much conflict one early writer said it was like the whole world was fighting with itself um, and uh, it says the nation rising against nation, earthquakes, famines, plagues. One of the largest earthquakes in human history happened in Pompeii in the 60s. Um, uh, he says they're going to deliver you over. That happened to the early, early Christians. 
And then it says many false prophets will arise. That happened. The Gnostics were a big problem for the early church as well. And then it says, um, in this gospel we preached in the whole world, our testimony to the nations, the Apostle Paul said that happened in his letters. Um, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Luke's version of this is when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee. The early Christians, because of this word from Jesus, did flee Jerusalem when they were surrounded, and they escaped to a town called Pella. So they heard this prophecy about themselves, and they responded. Then it says, um, don't go back to your housetop, just flee the city. They did that. Um, notice that it's local. This whole thing is local to Judea. Um, and he says, um, right here, here we go. Then there shall rise false Christ, false prophets, but what I told you beforehand. It says um, right here at the end of it, after the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, it says all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And it says right here, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place. He said this numerous times already. He's speaking to them. They asked about what's going to happen in their context, their day. He's not talking to us. And so Jesus said all those things, and all those things did take place. Like, for example, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, mm -hmm. that's from Daniel, chapter 7, verses yes. 13 through 14. Yeah. And in yeah. Daniel it says, he, he sees one like coming like the Son of Man, he came up to the Ancient of Days. That's the ascension. He came up to the Ancient of Days, was presented before him, and to him shall be given kingdom, dominion, mm -hmm. all of that. And it says, all the peoples, nations, languages will serve him. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is will never pass away. Um, according to the early Christians, that happened. Jesus is on the throne now. Yeah, He's it is. ascended. I in that, yes. So I think that the, clearly when he says the sign of the Son of Man in heaven coming on the clouds, uh, that language is used in the Old Testament. Uh, Jehovah comes on a cloud in judgment. He doesn't literally ride on a cloud. Like Isaiah 19, it says that he comes on a cloud against Egypt and the hearts of the Egyptians melt within them. Uh, but Jehovah wasn't literally surfing on a cloud. It was judgment language. So this language here that Jesus is using is all language that's familiar to them. And Jesus is ascended. He, he did come up to the Ancient of Days, and um, he did come on a cloud in judgment. Um, and uh, so my point is, and this is my point. I know you guys mm -hmm. probably have a busy day ahead of you. Uh, the tribulation passage there, Jesus is referring to what's going to happen in their generation. It did happen exactly on time, like he said, before they all died. And what's interesting is that the Watchtower Bible and Track uh, uh, Society has given many false prophecies since its inception, whether it's Charles Taze Russell, Judge Rutherford. In the 70s, you guys lost mm -hmm. a lot of your members because of false prophecies from your organization where they said that it was going to happen in this time, mm -hmm. and a lot of members of your organization lost a lot of money, a lot of property, because they were told that it was happening. It didn't happen. And the point is, is in Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, one of the tests that God gives his people for a prophet is if they say something's going to come to pass and it doesn't follow, it doesn't happen, that is the word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You should not be afraid of him. It even says that it would be a capital crime in Israel if someone gave a false prophecy and said, God said this is going to happen, and then it didn't happen. He says, even that prophet shall die. So the test of a prophet in Scripture is perfect yeah, prophetic that. fulfillment, mm -hmm. meaning if Jesus gave a false prophecy, he's to be rejected as a false prophet, even one. Mm -hmm. But your organization, unfortunately, since its inception, has had many false prophecies. I mean, many. Um, and that, so would, that would make... how are you... What would you consider that they're claiming to same prophecies? So, have you researched some of the early beginnings of yeah. your organization? Yeah, the Charles Taze Russell, the Dawn Bible mm -hmm. students and society? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so and you'll know that early on your organization was prophesying that this was the end of time, these are the end of the days, and that it was going to happen in... in there's a number of false prophecies. Specific times were given and it I, failed. I believe that maybe there's a misconception there. Um, no, I can pull them up for you if you like. There's so many false because prophecies. Because one of the beginning that Charles de Russell said was that the year 1914 was the beginning of Gentile time or the end. So, of their kingdom. Like, that's when Jesus actually ascended. That's, that's why he, I don't think it could be construed as a prophecy. He's just... 
saying this text right. applies to I know the one you're referring to. Right? There's, so, there's, there's a number I, I don't of know them, if, if that applies to no, so He's there's... not saying this is going to... He's just saying this verse, as the signs are showing now, it applies today. This this is what we believe. If, you, so, if you'd like, I could even give you a printout of a number of specific false prophecies from your organization that have happened over the years. My only point to do that is not to harm you as men. No, no. But to say that the test of a prophet in Scripture, there's two of them. Mm -hmm. One is perfect prophetic fulfillment. If you do not have perfect prophecy, if you fail even once, you are not speaking for the true God. And this isn't on you guys, but your organization and your leaders have given a number of false and failed prophecies over the years. Again, in, you, I'm, you can look this up easily. In the 70s, you lost a tremendous amount of your membership because there were specific prophecies given that failed and it harmed many of the members of your organization. Um, and the second test is in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5. And it is, it is that even if a prophet has signs and wonders... But if he leads you after another god, mm -hmm. that's how you know he's a false prophet. Mm -hmm. In other words, God has already revealed himself. If a prophet comes, he says he's a prophet, and he changes things about what God has said about himself, that's how you know he's a false prophet. How that applies to us? The Jehovah's Witness organization teaches that Jesus Christ has not eternally existed as God. Um, your organization teaches that Jesus is the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God. And um, Scripture teaches that Jesus is, is the eternal God. He's existed alongside the Father from all eternity. He's uncreated. Uh, and that He is God in the flesh. Your organization teaches that the Holy Spirit is not a person, that He's the active force, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, He, the Holy Spirit, will... Uh, guide you into all truth. He'll convict the world of sin and righteousness. Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as he, a person. In Scripture, the Holy Spirit speaks to Paul. Um, lying to the Holy Spirit, Peter says, is lying to God. Um, so Scripture sees the Holy Spirit as a person, not as a force. He's a he, and, um, and he's God. So Jesus is called God in Scripture. The Holy Spirit is called God in Scripture. The Father is called God in Scripture. And yet, Scripture is very clear: the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit. So you believe in Trinity? Is that of is course, okay. of course. Now I know that your organization oftentimes has taught your membership that Christians believe the Trinity is like uh, Jesus is in the baptism and he's throwing his voice, right? He, if he's God, who's talking to him? Kind of a thing. But Scripture is very clear: there's a distinction in persons, even all the way back in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The Father speaks to the Son in the Old mm -hmm. Testament, right? And uh, there's clearly a distinction in persons. But in Scripture, there's only one God, one being of God. But the Father is called God. Mm -hmm. Jesus is called God. The Holy Spirit is called God. But the Scripture makes a distinction between the persons within the one being of God. Um, so I knew, and I know you've heard Christians bring this to you before. But in John one. It says, in the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I know your translation has the words, the word a God, or the letter A. Um, but Do you that's, think that's significant? It's significant because if you know the Greek, that Greek text is consistent. There's no textual problems with it at all. Um, and this goes to, when you say, like, why is it different? It says in the Greek, in the beginning... But in the Greek, uh, sorry, in the English, in the Greek it says, an arche ein halogos. In the Greek that means as far back as you want to go forever and ever with no starting point, Jesus was already there. And he was proston theon. He was face to face with God the Father. That's intimacy, intimate relationship. And he was God. Um, it says the same as in the beginning with God, all things were created by him. Without him, nothing's been made that's been made. Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And then it says, and the word became flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us. But this is really key. And if you guys could just look this up, just, just look this up on your own. Um, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul's talking about Jesus, who's in the very form of God, mm -hmm. right? Um, he talks about Jesus and he says that all things were created by him and without him nothing. The same, same thing John is saying. Mm -hmm. But if you look at your translation, your translation adds words to the text. Because the text says that Jesus created all things. Your translation is the only one that adds the word all other things. But the Greek text is clear. 
it's all things. Where, where we get the English from is the original Greek, man, those, those manuscripts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your translation. Which has, one is that one? It's in Colossians chapter 1, actually. Mm -hmm. Let me pull it. Let me, I, I, you're, you're looking up Bible verse. Chapter 1? Yeah, Colossians chapter 1. Okay. Starting at verse 15. Is that the new world? It's kingdom interlinear. It, it just it just has the Greek. Excellent, yes, excellent, um, excellent. So starting at verse fifteen, he's the invisible. He's the image of the invisible God. <laughs> That's a long text for that, right? Yeah, because it, yeah. it, it makes it so much. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The word here, prototokos, does not mean first in order of creation. It means the preeminent one. The firstborn had all the rights. He was the heir of all things. And proof of that is that word language is used throughout the Old Testament. David is called God's firstborn, but David wasn't the firstborn. Israel is called God's firstborn. It has to do with preeminence, not order of creation. But watch here. It says, uh, because in him it was created that all things in the heavens and upon the earth the things visible and the things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, that's how I have memorized, all things through him and into him it has been created. And he is before all things. And in him all things have stood together. Um, he holds all things together. Jesus is the one sustaining everything. He holds it together. So my point there is that any English translation is going to say all things were created by Jesus. If you look at the New World, Because by means of him, okay. all other things were created in the heavens and the earth. And the reason I point that out is when you ask the question, like, well, what's different? Your organization has changed the person of Jesus Christ, where scripture says that he is the eternal God. As a matter of fact, this is important. It, you guys, and I love, by the way, I love Jehovah's Witnesses. You go to the text. You're like, what's the text say? I, that's so admirable. And I, I, with all my heart, I mean that. In Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it's a prophecy of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And it says something so peculiar to someone who only believes in one God, right? There's only one God. That's what Isaiah believes. He says it in Isaiah 43.10, Before me there was no God formed, neither shall it be after me. I'm the first, I'm the last. Besides me there is no God. It's in the same book. But in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it says a son is coming, a child is coming. So that's a human. And it says, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor. That's the name of Jehovah in the Old Testament. It's a title, Wonderful Counselor. El Gibor, the Mighty God, right? And what's interesting, it says the son who is coming, the child who's coming, is El Gibor, the Mighty God. If you look one chapter later, Jehovah, Yahweh, is called the Mighty God. That's an exclusive title for Jehovah, is the I'm Mighty God. I way to reference that. Well, if you want, I can. You want to show you that? Well, I I seen that text, and to me, when I seen it, it says um, he does, it doesn't say Almighty. It's the Mighty. God. It says Mighty. God, the Mighty, God, but yeah. not Almighty. Is there a difference? Yeah. Well, no, because it, and I, this uh, this would be the best thing I think if you go. Oh, thank you. That's so great. <laughs> I got this as a gift. Someone sent it to me as a gift, and it's like the best Bible ever. The, the leather is so great. It's so awesome. Um, it's my favorite I've ever had. Um, so, and you can, again, look at I don't expect the answer right now, guys. Just mm -hmm. look, look it up later. Look at Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And um, Isaiah 9. Isaiah chapter, what was this? This is uh, English Standard Version. English Standard. Yeah, but they're, they're, uh, any English trans, uh, translation is going to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, d -d 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 okay, here we go. There's Isaiah 9. 
a child is born, a son, government being punished older, his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, right? Everlasting Father is the Father of Eternity. That's what it means. So Jesus is the Eternal One. And it says Prince of Peace, so the increase of his, that's Jesus, right? So, you know, my, my take on that, on that scripture there, um, and I know you're going to show me the... Yeah, just to show you the text where, um, where um, in Isaiah 10... Um, uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, this is because it's a new Bible. I have it memorized and where it's at. Um, I like that you haven't gone digital. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't. That's, I, uh, that's good. Um, there, there's a different feel to when you, when you turn in the pages. I know. Just it, it's. I just. I try to encourage everyone that get a Bible, a physical Bible. Um, um, okay. So uh, da, 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 uh, hold on. One of Israel in truth. Roman the Lord's turn Jacob. Here we go. Here. Okay. So Isaiah 10, this is so, Isaiah 9 is where he's called the mighty God. Jesus is the mighty God. And it says here in Isaiah 10, in that day the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but they will lean on the Lord, that's Yahweh or Jehovah, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, the Hebrew word is Yahweh, but I know your organization prefers the word Jehovah, and that's, that's okay, right? mm -hmm. but that's Jehovah. They'll lean on Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel in truth, we're talking about Jehovah here. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. Jehovah is the mighty God. El Gabor. So you can look in an interlinear. Interlinear. Interlinear, you'll see that within a chapter, Yahweh is called the, the mighty God. But the son who is coming is the mighty God. What's your name? Jeff. Jeff. Nice to meet you, Jeff. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Sam. Alberto. Alberto. Thank you. Do you, do thank you, you. mind if I come back? We'll have more conversation. I yeah. would be honored. All right, Please come Jeff. back. Please come well, back. Thank you, sir. Thank Appreciate you. it. And uh, we'll have a good one. Thank you so much. Okay? Thank you so much. Right. Appreciate yeah. you, gentlemen, coming to yeah. talk. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, do you know if anybody's in the next home? They're not. Oh. Not right now. Oh. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is me being irresponsible about my Christmas lights. He's just a tall. Yeah, they're not there right now. Thank you.